Well, uh, hello everyone. It's a gr great to be here. Great to be here with Darren. So, m most of you know um, Darren's golf accomplishments. You know, he's been involved in uh, uh, eight Ryder Cup teams, five as a player, one as a captain, two as a vice captain. Um, I think he's been named Sports Texaco Sports Star of the Year six yeah, times uh, yeah, in Europe. Is that yeah? Sorts, all I mean, sorts of stuff. For, yeah, drink, I, for drinking. For drinking, yeah, he says. Um, Actually, as you can imagine, in Northern Ireland, he's a bit of a legend. Uh, it's, it's, it's one word. They say Tiger over here. They say Darren over there. Um, Darren, of course, won the Open Championship years ago. Uh, he's won two World Match uh, Cups, which has been awesome. He's won 20 time, 21 times worldwide. Um, all of that is wonderful, and we probably all know that. Uh, what you might not know is, uh, you know, Darren and his wife, Alice, and his family, they live uh, primarily down in Abaco with us. Um, the, you know, what they do for uh, the staff, what they do for charity, what they do for children in Ireland, uh, in, in the Bahamas, is really second to none. Uh, he gives his time um, all the time. Uh, never, never complains about a thing. Uh, goes way out of his way to do all this, and it's just beloved by the people in uh, in the Bahamas. Uh, I know Darren and Allison will be here for the better part of a week. Some of you will get to know them. I hope you all do. Uh, it's it's uh, way worthwhile. We're happy to uh, have him here, and I'm uh, proud to call him a friend. Darren, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. David, thank you for those kind words, and. Um, it's a pleasure for Alison and myself to be here at Willow Bend for the first time. Um, as David said, uh, we spend a lot of time down in Abaco. And um, for those that have been there, I don't know how many of you guys have been down in Abaco yet. Um, some of you have, some of you haven't. For those that haven't, I strongly recommend that you get down there. It's a beautiful place and certainly we enjoy it a lot. And earlier this year, I was playing in, um, where was I? Newport Beach in California. And um, Alison was with me for, for a few weeks and she went right home back from California, back to Ireland to look after her own business. And I went to Florida to do some corporate stuff at TPC and Sawgrass. And then the COVID thing all exploded all, all, all over the world. Alison had gone home. I went straight down to the Bahamas. Um, and then by the time all the borders, everything got shut down, Alison couldn't get to the Bahamas. I couldn't get home, what have you. So um, she had to do without me for five months. So I think she was quite pleased to get rid of me for five months, but <laughs> it was a bit of a strange time. So I'm sure we all we have all been through it. But um, as I say, the Abaco Club and, and Southworth and, and David in particular have been very good to me, very kind to me. Um, I've been there since the place opened in 2005, and it's a it's a wonderful property with um, a golf course which is the best one in the Bahamas, top three in the Caribbean. It's a sensational place, but the the beach is good, everything about it. And they, they have a very dangerous place called Flippers Beach Bar, which is strange enough, a beach bar, which is right beside the beach, which is 20 yards from the putting green, which is 30 yards from the practice range. That's not a really good combo. Well, it is, but it's not. But um, as I said, if you haven't been there, it's really worth a, tr worth a trip to get down there and, and um, to go see it. So I'm going to hit a couple of balls here and um, try and explain to you a little bit about what what I try to do and um, what I see that works and what doesn't work. So if anybody's got any questions at any stage, then please feel free, just stick your hands up or shout or whatever and just ask me any questions. So this is my, um, this is my 58 degree, this is my low wedge. And um, this goes, if I hit it normal, about uh, 85 yards. So that's too long for that flag. but. You can see most of the one of the questions that get asked all the time is about how how the pros hit it so far when they look as if they swing so easy at it, and it's basically just because our timing is so good and because we're obviously it's our job, so we're practicing all the time. So it looks as if we're hitting it very easy, but in reality we're hitting it pretty hard. But you'll see here that my swing, I'm a little bit of a old school swing which is rotation rotation but what I see a lot in pro-am that we that we, uh, we play on every week is that most amateurs we play with have got some form of a lateral move i.e. they move off the golf ball 
or they move forward when they're going back. When they do that, then your point of where well, the bottom of your swing is either going to be way behind it or way in front of it. That's why people top the ball, they thin the ball, you hit all sorts of funny shots. Most pros, you will see that we stand, our balance is pretty central, we turn back and we turn through very, very little lateral movement. That's how we're consistently strike the ball. So, again, this is my low wedge turn and a turn. And they're all sort of circa the same distance all the time. So, if we want to hit it a little bit lower in the wind, I just move the ball a little bit further. So, that standard ball position is just inside my left heel. If I want to hit it lower, it's more towards the middle of my stance. If I want to hit it higher, it's more towards my, my left toe. So, this one will be a little bit lower. So, this is a little bit more back in my stance, but I still make exactly the same swing. Ball goes lower. If I want to hit it higher, ball goes a little bit more towards the front of my foot, just over a bunker or just over water. Want to hit the ball higher, same swing. Ball goes a little bit higher. It usually doesn't go as straight as it does this all the time on weekday and tournament times. Usually, the ball doesn't listen to me that well. But so that was my lobby. This is my nine iron, and all I'm trying to do is make the same swing with my for standard shots with my low waves. 9-iron, 5-iron driver, whatever, just obviously stand a little bit further away from it because the ball, the club's a little bit longer. So, this is my 9-iron, make the same swing, turn on a turn. So, that ball um, will pitch, well, my caddy will tell me that it'll pitch 144 yards. So, that's what he tells me it's supposed to go. And if it doesn't, it's his fault, never mind. So, one more, same thing, turn and a turn. Does it look pretty easy? Does it look simple? It should be simple, that's what we're trying to do, but we get everybody, including ourselves, we all, you know, down in Abaco there when I had five months, like everybody, I was um, sitting there and fishing a little bit, but looking at social media and stuff and I'm watching all these coaches and all these guys saying you should do this, you should do that. Go out the next day and try the stuff that they tell me. What an idiot I am for listening to all these people. I mean, it's just I got myself completely tied up in knots, got, well, do this and do that. But I had nothing, I was bored, I had nothing else to do. So, basic standard nine iron. And um, that's a very nice shank. So we can do that. I didn't do that deliberately. I could claim I did, but I didn't. Normal nine iron. So I go to seven iron now. So again, seven iron's just exactly the same sort of swing thoughts as my low wedge, nine iron, same thing, turn and turn. Anybody, any questions yet? How do the pros spin the ball or not spin it? Yeah, a lot of the times, um, you know, when you're watching the pros on TV, we're trying to not spin the ball. That's a very good question. So um, if we're trying to spin the golf ball, we'll have a lot of hand speed down at the bottom. If we're trying to not spin it, it'll be very dead wrist. You'll have very, very little hand action. That's how we keep it dead and take the spin off. Always hit the ball first. Try to hit the ball first, but always do. So, you know, if I get steeper on it and hit more down on it, then obviously I'm going to have more friction on the golf course, on the on the face, I'm going to have more spin. If I want to hit one um, with less spin, then I'll hardly take a divot. So I'll hit one um, like this that I'll just sort of brush the turf. I'll hardly take a divot here at all, he said. 
like that. So I just, all I did was brush the turf and that ball would have way less spin on it than the other ones. Very easy to spin it too much for us. That's why we're trying to take it off all the time. No, nearly all the time that, to not take a divot is just a specialty shot because that's really, that's, that's tough. That's really tough. But we're always trying to go ball turf, ball turf, ball turf. So, um, I was talking about this earlier. Um, bad golf, or go good golf, is from a club head that's going from high to low. Bad golf is from a club head that's going from low to high. So that goes back to the first thing that I said. If you have a lot of movement this way or this way to start off your swing, then what's the club doing? You're always going to back up. Club goes high. So when you hit the ball off this part, it's because you're backing up going like this. You never see the pros doing that. The pros will always turn through it like this. You'll see that the club's coming up here and I'll stop my club right about here. You see that my club's low. Most amateurs, when they finish there, their hands are up here. So this will be almost like a little low rip punch shot and you'll see how low the club head stays. So that's hitting down into the, from high to low. This, because your hands always lead the club head. The only time that your hands don't lead the club head in the golf swing is in a bunker shot when you're trying to hit a flop shot. The rest of the time, your hands are always, always leading the club head. If they don't, mm. that water on the left or the woods on the right or whatever, never good. So, you know, for me, trying to picture it, if I looked at my swing in slow motion at impact, you'll always see that I'm, you see all the pros are there, <clears throat> everybody. They have to be to get a consistent strike, flight, all that sort of stuff. If your hands release early, and go this way. Sometimes you might have to do that if you've got a tree ahead of us that we had to launch it so high. But in terms of a standard shot all the time, your hands never beat, the club head never beats the, never beats your hands. And then you square it up by turning your body accordingly, turning through. You will see that most of the guys will finish, they'll finish this way, you know, all the way across there. You won't see any of them finish with their clubs pointing down there because they're underneath them and they'll be snapping it. So if I was going to make a full swing and you'll see where I'm, uh, where I'm going to finish, this would be a normal sort of full swing. So you see where I'm finished? That's, that's where I go. Um, a lot, but usually if I'm really into you know, practicing hard. Um, when I'm at tournament stuff, it'll be eight, nine, nine hour days, just practicing. Um, playing, it depends if there's any guys there that want to go out and have a bit of fun and have a gamble and whatever. <laughs> it depends who's about to go and play. But um, I like to, I spend 75% of my time putting green, chipping green. That's what it is. It's not, it's not this, it's all down there because if you can turn that um, six into a five, five into four, except that that's the difference between winning and losing. So it's all short game, short game, short game. This bit's important, don't get me wrong, but that's the bit that makes you a little bit of cash at the end of the week. It depends, if we're in Abaco, usually we're at Flipper Speed Bar before the, before the round. That's, <laughs> and that's the truth, that's usually what we do. And then we go out and play, and, we have the little, uh, uh, what do you call it, the little cart fries right in front of them, so they all got stopped up and all sorts of stuff. So I go down there, so my, all during my uh, my time down there, I play with um, the course superintendent down there, a guy called Matt DeMace, John Wiley, the food and beverage manager, Kevin O'Malley, Kevin O'Malley, the project manager, Brian Shaver, the golf director, and sometimes Clint Kemp, who owns Black Fly Lodge, one of the best fishing, fly fishing lodges in the world, and we go out and play six balls, everybody in their own in their own carts, and just Brian and I would play all the rest of the guys, play a full scramble, give them what they think is way too many shots, but never enough, so we would just beat them always about one or two, and then have them bitching all the time whenever we get in back into flippers again. So it was, and then we had to give them up a little, one or two more shots, and then we had to 
sort of bring them back down again and all that. So that that's that's my fun goal. Playing playing with those guys. That is that's a lot of fun down there. Would you take a look at someone like JB Holmes, who's one of the longest on the tour as well? And JB swings even shorter than I do. He only takes it up to here. Or Tony Finau, same sort of thing. He doesn't have that big a turn. You know, if I if I wanted to make a big turn, um, you know, I could stand there and go like that if I want to, because I've got a stretch and pull thing that I do every day. And, but to me, that messes with my timing. You know, I grew up in, in Ireland where windy, bad weather, so I had to control the golf ball all the time. So I find it easier to control my timing if it was just that little bit shorter. Um, so there's not, yes, Tiger and those guys, some of them make a bigger turn, but not, not all of them make those big turns and the guys that hit it far as well. Tony Fiener probably hits it further than Bryson DeChambeau with a shorter golf swing. So a big turn doesn't necessarily mean more speed. It's a big turn or just how far back he hits them? It's a little bit of both. It's your, it's your turn, it's the width that they have up here. So if you watch them, JB Holmes is his right arms out there. DeChambeau's right arms out there. With the guys that this is maybe not as wide, that's loses power, loses speed. So it it's it's the width. If you can be much wider here, further away, so it's like a straighter left arm, that's how you get more speed and more distance. Easier said than done. Way easier said than done. Oh, 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 I know I feel as if the Europeans do so well in the Ryder Cup. Because we play like a team, basically, that's what's happening. And, you know, you look at the past few Ryder Cups, and the Americans have tried to cover, to, to, to take more of the Europeans' blueprint, and the guys sort of get on a little bit better now than they used to. And, um, you know, it used to be that those guys, you know, they didn't, not all of them particularly liked each other. Um, that's not a really good scenario for a team. Um, whereas all the Europeans, even if we didn't like each other, for that particular week, we did like each other. So, you know, that team spirit was always something that the Europeans were very strong on. The Americans have got much more into our way of doing it now and are, are very strong. But also, if you take a look at um, some of the best young players in the world. A lot of them were non-American. There were a lot of Europeans coming through there for quite some time. Whereas now, if you it's all cyclical. You take a look now, you've got Matthew Wolf, you've got Patrick Cantlay, you've got, um, what do you call him, Colin Marikawa. Um, you've got quite a few of young Americans, since the, oh, sensational young players, and not so many Europeans, young, good Europeans. You've got Victor Hovland. After that, um, not so many, and those European uh, old guard are getting a little bit older now. So it's gonna to be tough for Europe in the upcoming Ryder Cups. I'm not saying they won't win or whatever, but it'll be, Europe had a good run of, of good young players. Now it's gone back the other way again. So we shall see, we shall see what's gonna happen. I think um, next one, next year, America's gonna be very difficult to beat at Whistling Straits. You know, you guys are gonna be ridiculously strong. Um, but that's the way it is, you know. Home, home and away, and I think they did the right thing this year by uh, postponing it, uh, because the Ryder Cup without the fans, you know, without over here going USA, 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 or in Europe going ole, 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 it's not the same, you know. And, and if you, and if you really want to, playing in a Ryder Cup is like nothing else that we do. There is nothing, com, nothing even comes close to it. You know, I've been, I've been fortunate to win um, a major. I've been in contention for quite a few to win them. And the pressure you feel in the back nine on Sunday to win a major is nothing compared to what it is in the Ryder Cup. Ryder Cup's like 20, 50 times the amount of pressure because you're playing for everybody else as well. And, you know, for guys to go and play in a Ryder Cup, especially the first timers without the crowd and without the atmosphere, it just wouldn't be the right way to do it. So I think they've done the right thing by postponing and hopefully for this time next year, we'll all be sitting here without masks on and all that sort of stuff. So. You know, it's going to be really exciting. I don't know if, if you've ever been to Whistling Straits or you've played over there, but the golf course is fabulous. I mean, it really is. It's a brilliant Ryder Cup golf course. Risk reward. You're going to see nines, tens, and all sorts of stuff there. Brilliant golf course. So it'll be good. But I think America will be big favorites next year. Royal Fort Rush. 
Did you go up there? Ah, you gotta go there. Royal Port Rush. Um, that's the home for us over there. But uh, Royal Port Rush is fabulous. Have you been um, to? Have you gone to Scotland? Yeah. Have you gone to Macarena's Dunes? Yeah. Uh, it's unbelievable. One of my favourite courses in the world. The way the, the greens just lie into this, uh, just absolutely brilliant. Um, Port Rush, a little bit different because it's a real old Harry Colt design and um, it was very fair. It's a great test. You got some, you got great courses all over Ireland, as you do anywhere. But you know, you got you got Royal Port Rush, Royal County Down, and you go down to Port Monarch, Royal Dublin. You got all sorts of Killarney, um, Adair Manor, all sorts of brilliant ones, K Club, everything. So, but next time you go, you should try and go north. I appreciate what you're saying, and that answers a very good point. You know, you've got all these classic design golf courses that the guys are just overpowering these days because they all hit a 350 through the air and all that sort of stuff. So there's one very easy way to do it, and they've done it this week at um, Olympia Fields. They've narrowed the fairways a little bit. They've made the rough thick and the greens firm. And look at the scores. That's how they do it. You know, it depends. It's, it's a fine line. If you're going to go and watch a professional play golf, and you go to a tournament, and you want to be entertained. Do you want to see them hit it in the rough and hack it out with a low wedge, get it on the ground and make bogey? Do you want to see them hit it um, 350 up the middle, hit it 275, three wood to three feet and make eagle? What would you prefer to see? You know, it's, it's, that's the conundrum, isn't it? You know, you, you, we, when we play at tournaments, yes, it's our livelihood, it's what we do, but we're also in the supposed entertainment industry. And it, for me, the occasional tournament where you've got a hack out of the rough and it's difficult, that's fine. But for the most part, I would, if I was a spectator, I want to see guys hitting shots that I can't hit. That's what I would like to see. So hence, 24, 25 under, but that, and that stuff. Like, for example, Bryson DeChambeau at the moment, hitting it nearly 400 yards. Would you go and watch him do that just to see him do it? You probably would. You know, it's, it's, it's a hard one. But as long as they still have maybe, I don't know, five tournaments a year where there's thick, rough and hard greens, then that's fine. The rest of the time, let the guys go after it and shoot as many under as they can. There's all this talk about a tournament golf ball where it's not going to go as far and all that. But then if you start putting the stuff on to us, then it, it, the game that we're playing is a totally different game. It is to, to some extent, but then it's different equipment, there's different golf balls. You can't do that. That's not the way the game was supposed to be. We, as professionals, were supposed to be people who or reasonably good at it. But that's not to say that you and I could not go out and have a game. If you start telling, well, I can only use a certain type of golf ball and you, you can use whatever you want, then that's not, we're not playing the same game. And that's what we're always trying to stick to all the time. With, when you're hitting irons, you're always trying to hit down on the golf ball and compress it. When you have your wood in your hand, you tee it up, you're trying to stay behind it a little bit and launch it up. So. We all tend to jump out a little bit, a little bit, and go out a little bit too hard. Um, but if you can think about keeping your head behind it and leading with your left hip, opening up a little bit, that's probably the easiest way. Because then you'll you'll probably end up staying in your spine angle a little bit more. What happens? A lot of people jump up and then the spine straightens without getting too complicated. Excuse me, and then your hands manipulate and then then try and compensate. So hence where you get one over there, one over here, all that sort of stuff. But if you can think about, you get up here and your hip opens, and your head stays there, and just stay in your spine angle a little bit, that'll help an awful lot. I'll try and show you now on a driver whenever I hit over this way, but and um, see if I can do it. I, I may not be, I may not be the best guy to ask about mental strength. I have to say, if I was, I'd probably have won a lot more than I actually have. Um, you know. When I've won my biggest tournaments, majors, WGCs, all that big tournaments, I've really had the attitude where, if you pardon the expression, I don't give a shit. I don't care. You know, and I know that sounds a bit strange, but if you get too much into the outcome of what each shot is going to be, then you're piling pressure on yourself. You know, you're going to tighten up. You're going to not free wheel. Whereas if you can get into the mindset of hitting it, finding it, hitting it again, without worrying about where it goes, you'll play much better. And I was able to do that a few times in my career, and that's when I played my best. Because if you're out there thinking about A, about swing, and B, about what score you're on, and 
um, you know, oh, I've got a chance to win this. You're never going to perform at your best because all you're doing is is um, all you're doing is is putting pressure on yourself. So when I won the Open uh, Championship at Royal St George's in 2011, the first time I looked at the leaderboard was in the 16th green. I didn't look at it at any stage before that because looking at the leaderboard may have affected how I was going to play. So up to that point, and I knew I was doing okay. And it was wonderful to look up and see there was four clear. That was <laughs> that was a definite bonus at that stage. But if I'd looked, and I'd, it was a deliberate plan to not look at the leaderboard because I did not want to put a, a more pressure on myself on the way around. Because then I would let the outcome affect how I played. I tried to let my attitude affect my outcome. And that's the, easier, that's the easiest way to do it. It's not a very easy thing to do all the time, especially you know, if you're trying to win the club championship or you're, you're trying to have your best score or whatever because you'll get ahead of yourself all the time. You'll think about... Oh, I've got the seventh hole. That's one of the toughest holes in the course to play. I've got this coming up. Or oh, maybe I can make birdie there. Believe me, we all think the same way if we if we don't control our thoughts. It's the same for us as well. Um, but the more you, the less you can place importance on any shot, the more chance you've got of pulling it off. So, so basically, the more you ramp yourself up and make yourself nervous about a shot, the less chance you have of hitting a good one. Basically, I'll go. Where am I going, Mike? Up over there. Okay, so, let me see, so I'm going to, he's telling me to head up over this way, so this is my driver, this is no, I'm not really trying to do anything different with this than I was with my irons, I'm not trying, trying to hit it any harder for a standard driver, sometimes I do, but for a standard one, I just try and make the same sort of swing, so it's a turn, and I turn a little bit, hoping it'll be like this. So, oh, that's easy. I didn't hit that one hard. That was all right. Uh, that was a little bit stiff, that one. But, um, you know, it's the same thing. If I want to hit it lower, the ball will be back in my stance a little bit. If I want to hit it higher, I'll move it up there, and I'll try and keep my spine angle back this way. That's what I was, was saying. So, if I try and hit this one harder, and I'm going to launch it up here a little bit more, I'll just keep my head behind it, keep my spine angle, and put a little bit more speed into it. So this one should go higher. Like that. So you probably saw there that I said back back this way a little bit. So that's, that's, how, that's how you do it. And, you know, growing up, <coughs> Growing up in Ireland, um, playing on a golf over there when the weather's blowing and horrible and all that sort of stuff, windy, this would be the shot that I would be hitting a lot, but of a low sort of bullet. A bit like that, so the ball, wind never touches and rips through it. I don't need to impact, I don't need to impact, but I don't want to hold them going this way. They've got to release at some stage to get the club going, going there. Whether well, with the driver you're trying to hit up on it um, for the long ones. Um, but with the irons, it's, it's a more of a hold. With the, with the driver, a little, little bit more release with it. So, and there. Let me see if I can put a little bit more speed into this one. I'll try and hit this one hard. So you'll see here a lot of people whenever they um, when they want to try and hit it hard, will speed up their takeaway, and then their transition gets they lose their timing and transition. If you want to hit one hard, you ever really need to try and step on one. You take your backswing as slow as you can and then put the speed in from here. Where, where you get most speed is the, the pulling down on the, on, the, on the grip from the top. That's how you get the most maximum speed. So if you go fast off, then you're going to lose speed and change the direction. So this one will go slow. And I'll put a lot of speed into this one. I hope. I'm going to see. So, 
whatever on on Trackman for um, obviously I'm in the championship one of the older guys, but my speed on on Trackman is about oh club speeds about one fifteen, one sixteen, ball speeds about one seventy between one seventy one seventy three, which is still pretty fast. That gets it out there. So my carry my carry is if I if I really hammered my carry is about two two ninety two carry. And then probably maybe twenty roll or whatever. Sometimes and that's that's flat cam, that's not straight down wind. So that sort of still works. <laughs> Makes it a little bit easier. So it's not all not all bad. Uh, run for president. <laughs> I think Tiger yeah, Tiger is a bit of a conundrum, you know. Um, Tiger's been a very good friend of mine all the way through my career. I first played with him in 1996 at the Open at uh, Open Championship at Lytham. And we were coached by uh, Butch Harmon, spent a lot of time together in Vegas. Um, and indeed, all of us played a lot of practice rounds with Tiger. Um, and, you know, he's, I don't know, you got some people that said, Mr. Nicholas, best player in the world, Tiger, best player in the world. It's, it's, it's one of these. Jack's record, obviously, with all those majors, are, is more. But Tiger, um, you know, simply just one of the best players that's ever lifted the golf club. Just unbelievable. You put it, put all his personal stuff to one side, put him down totally as a as a golfer. Just uh, incredible. He's tight as a duck's ass, though. He won't spend a penny, but that's Tiger Woods. That will, we won't go into that. Um, I bought him more dinners than his zero that he's bought me. But anyway. But he's a, really, he's a really, really good friend. When I won the Open in 2011, he was and he couldn't play at a bad knee. He was texting me every day, uh, every day. said, Darren, um, and what, he watched all the golf, and he said, I didn't like what you did in number three. Play a little bit more left. Number seven, you hit a great pitch in there. Try and do the same sort of thing. But he was sending me messages of advice on how to do it every day during the Open Championship. I mean, he's just, Tiger's a good guy. But obviously, when you think about these um Child prodigies, they're, they're, they're brought up very, very differently. And, and from a young age, he was, he was trained to do that by, by his dad to become the best that they possibly could. So the competitor in him still wants to play. And he can still play, obviously, but he's just not dreaming now. 44 is back. He's had all these surgeries. But he's still, until he can't walk anymore, he'll still be chasing that, that Jack's record. And you can't fault him for it, you know. He's earned the right to play as long as he wants to, wherever he wants to, and hopefully he will win some more. Um, if anybody can do it, he can do it. He wants to prove everybody wrong, and he's done that a few times already in his career, and I'm sure he'll do it again. The most important part of the golf, golf swing, what do I consider? I could say position of impact. I could say... Um, clubs leading the, the hands leading the club head. Most important part where I see a lot of it going wrong is transition up here. So people will go this way, or they'll go that way. Throws the club off. If you can't deliver the club in a in a consistent way coming down, you're never going to have a consistent golf game. So I think transition has got to be the most important part of the golf swing because you won't strike it consistently unless you have a consistent position up there. Pardon? Oh, none. I don't have any. <laughs> I'm not that smart. <laughs> all I try and do is, is just keep it smooth, basically, unless I'm trying to jump all over a driver. The only this uh, is called, um, what's it called? Oh, yeah. Randy Marsh stretching pole. So every day, um, I do numerous different stretches with this, um, you know, to try and loosen up my shoulders, all this sort of stuff to try and make sure I'm making a big enough turn where, you know, I'm all the way around here, um, the same going this way, um, all of them, but down here. So I do all sorts of different stretches. And this is the one here where it goes straight across your shoulders. Uh, you're trying to make sure that this, obviously, this bit here is getting back to the ball. And I'm, because I've been using this for so long, I'm, I'm pretty flexible, believe it or not. So, you know, it gets all the way back around there, which is, which is quite a bit. So, and that's my, 
that's my stretching. So I do this every day before I hit any golf balls. Um, I'm always using this, and it just goes in the bag wherever I go. So, Randy Myers stretching pole, um, M Y E R S, Randy Myers stretching pole. It's simple. Um, probably about ten minutes, just to get loosened up and um, to get ready, but. It's helped me a lot that just staying flexible because if you lose your flexibility then you can't make the turns, you can't do everything you need to do. Either of them would be a privilege and an honour but probably Tiger because um, I would respect Mr Nicholas a little bit more because with Tiger I could take the piss out of Tiger all the way around playing with him. I could just get in his ribs all the time because I know him so well. So I'd probably have more fun he would, um, he, I played him in the final of the World Match Play at La Costa and, um, in, two th in 2000, 2000, and Tiger was playing at his, at his best at that stage and we're good friends and blah, blah, blah. He had an off day, I had a good day and I beat him in the final. And afterwards went in, did all the press and whatever and went to my, uh, went to my locker. And he had left a, a, a note on my locker. It says, P.S., I said, congrats, be proud. P.S. You're still a F.F. So I don't need to say what F.F. stands for. You can probably all figure it out. But um, so that's uh, the sort of relationship that I have with Tiger and myself. No, Rory's obviously about to become a father any minute, any any hour. And um, you know, it, in terms of all the guys there right now, he is by far the most naturally gifted um, of any of them. You know, you could say DJ the way he played last week, and Rory, DJ makes it look easy as well. Maybe I'm a little bit biased because Rory came through my foundation when he was 12 back home in, in, in Ireland and stuff. But, um, you know, Rory, when he plays and when he plays well, he flows. He flows like Tiger flows. DJ did the same, but I think Rory is the most gifted, naturally gifted one of all of them. And... Um, I think he's obviously got other things with, with Erica Jew now any time. Um, it's easy to see. He gets down on himself a little bit too quick and, you know, saying that he can't get himself going. And It's got to be tough, though, when you have that much expectation on you that you're gonna, supposed to win every week or be one of the guys going to win every week. And golf is fickle. You know, he could be playing great and a lip out of the wrong hole makes the whole momentum change everything. And he just got a little bit frustrated. And... Um, yeah, it, it is different playing without crowds. You know, I've only got back played um, three tournaments now since Champions Tour, since we restarted them. Without the fans, there is very, very different. The atmosphere is, it, it is very, uh, very flat. Rory, if he gets back on on a run again, could win five, six tournaments in a row. He's that good. So, in answer to your question, do you think it was the best Rory? No, I think there's still a lot, a lot left in him. He's only thirty. He's not that old yet. <laughs>